Welcome everyone. I started AIMSEC about 19 years ago now. You might be interested in the picture there on this slide. Um, I was working in Musenberg that afternoon with a class in Musenberg Primary School and it was part of the global maths lesson. Um, every year we have a lesson which involves about 10,000 um, learners from around the world. So we hope that's in October. So we hope you'll join us then. Hello everyone, my name is Caroline. I'm the founder of Bubbly Maths. As you can see from my picture, I, I am a maths entertainer. So I do serious maths, rich mathematical activities, but I do it in a way that engages all learners so that they all enjoy doing mathematics. Cynthia. Hi, hello. Yes, my name's Cynthia Fritz, and my photo was also in, in South Africa, uh, but at the high school at um, Stellenbosch, where we were doing a course for teachers from South Africa. And uh, that's what I've enjoyed doing for the past 10 years now. Yes, yeah, so Cynthia is one of the key people who is involved with running the um, AIMSEC courses. So if you're on one of our courses now, you'll, you'll certainly meet Cynthia regularly. The idea behind lifelong learning is that we start, well, we start when we're born. I, I guess we probably start before we're born. But and more formally, we start when we interact with, our, with the other people in our homes. And of course, then when we go to um, learning centres, and we, we know that the school career is all about learning and the uh, what what's absolutely critical and this, this goes and we, we, Tony calls it the spiral learning ramp and this doesn't end when we leave school and one of the things that's really important and very helpful to the learners that we teach is that we model lifelong learning we let them know that we're still learning. We're adults and we're still learning every single day. We're teachers and we've got so much still to learn. There's so much we don't know. And we, if we model it that way, you're helping create lifelong learners in your own classrooms. There's always so much more to learn for all of us, no matter how old we are. Mm -hmm. And information is now available to everybody who's got a smartphone or access to the internet and children can discover what they want to find out they can discover it for themselves so we can't expect as teachers as maybe when I started teaching we were the you know we were the fountain of knowledge we gave the information now children can find out a lot of things for themselves that the teacher doesn't know so if you don't if you, if you encourage them to ask questions where you don't, where perhaps you're not going to under, know the answer, that's perfectly fine. It's really good. So as Caroline said, you can model being a keen learner by saying, oh, that's a good question. Really interesting. I don't know. Let's find out and um, find out together. I'm going to go on to tell you about what we're going to be uh, looking at and doing and working together on today. So we're going to be improving skills, knowledge and understanding of a, uh, quite a few things that you're going to be teaching. Now, starting off with multiplication tables and multiples, understanding multiples and factors, and then moving on to linear functions and line graphs and mapping diagrams and gradients of lines, and then composite functions and inverse functions. And here's another spiral, and this depicts the spiral of learning in school. And so what we're going to do is start with something that we can, we can imagine um, young learners doing, in, uh, five year olds doing, or anybody, um, doing um, and we're all going to do that together so that's the starter activity and then now you'll see rather unusually the order that um, I've listed um, the activities for today starts at the bottom because we're thinking about this going over the same ground and this models what we do in school so we revisit ideas 
that the children met earlier or should have met earlier may have forgotten, of course, we revisit those ideas, we reinforce the knowledge they already have and the understanding, and we build on that knowledge. Time and again, we revisit these ideas. And what we start with is the idea here of simple counting and then um, ways of counting that introduce, bring in the multiplication tables and we carry on from there. So you'll see we've got nine different activities, starting with something you could do uh, with lower primary, with early years and going right through to school leaving age. So we want you to join in and we want you to um, really feel that uh, uh, this is something that you can ask questions about as well as answer our questions. Now we're going to do some counting. Right, what we're going to do, this is an action activity. We're going to model this and then you are all going to do it together. So the idea is we're going to count well, count to 50 when you're doing this with your learners. We're only going to go up to 15. I'm going to count, it's clap counting. So it means I'm going to clap with the two times table. Tony's going to clap on the three with the three times, on multiples of three with the three times table. And Cynthia is going to clap on the fives. And I'm also going to speak the count. It's going to make it a little bit easier. You can't see a choir on Zoom if everyone says something and it all comes out at a different time. So it's not going to be as good as it would be if you do it in class. In class, everyone's going to clap at the same time. Here, it's going to be all a little bit out of sync. So we're going to do it really, really slowly. In class, you can do it much faster unless you're working with very young learners. Okay. In the classroom, this works beautifully. Online, because of the delays, it's more problematic. And Caroline, Cynthia and I are in three different places. OK, so Caroline's suggesting that she's the only one who does the counting. Normally, all the children count. Now, this is important because it's something you can do with very young children who can all count. All right. Um, as soon as they can count, they can do this, even if they can only count up to 20. And what you do is you get you can do it all, first of all, with the whole class counting. Um, um, counting and clapping on every second beat. So they count to, or they clap on two, four, six, eight, and so on. Um, and, and then you can practice the other multiplication tables. And then ultimately, not right to start with, you do this um, synchronous of two or more multiplication tables. So this is something you build up to over a matter of weeks or longer with small children. And it doesn't, it, it's, it, for older children, for upper primary, it's something that would only take four or five minutes at the beginning of a lesson, but it reminds them. You can then introduce the vocabulary of multiples and factors, um, but it, it, it's an activity that in, when you first start it with just the multiples of one of the numbers, like you could do fives or whatever you choose. Um, it, it, uh, it's simple. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 12, 13, 14, 15. So now we're all going to do it together. So you can choose to be on basically team, my team, multiples of two, Tony's team, multiples of three, Cynthia's team, multiples of five. We're all going to do that together. It's going to be a bit mad and we'll have a good giggle, but we're all just going to do it together. Um, I, want, I want to emphasize that with lower primary, you would work up to this over a matter of um, quite a long, long time. And you wouldn't attempt to do this synchronous of um, two or three multiples. But we're not working with 
five or six year olds now we're working with <laughs> mature teachers so um we're trying to show you where you could ultimately be with 10 11 year olds yes and they could they could do this okay and you could also introduce the vocabulary so please join caroline or join me or join cynthia and let's let's have a giggle about this it, it, it's um we're all going to clap on our chosen multiple and caroline is going to lead us and clap nice and loud one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen 17, 18, 19, and 20. And now we can give ourselves a big clap. <laughs> it, it's, it's a great way to um, reinforce this idea of multiplication tables. And um, we'll leave it to you to, uh, uh, to invent and to be creative with it and use it in, in your own way, in your own classroom. And when you've uh, done it, ask, ask your learners, when will all the groups clap together? So now that's the, what you're going to introduce then with older children is the idea of a common multiple. And as Caroline said, the lowest common multiple here is, is 30. I'll see. And mm, yes. Tommy just said it. Lowest common multiple of two, three, three and, five. and five. Yes, yes. So that's a, a very, it can be a very short activity for in the classroom, but it does reinforce the ideas that they've learned earlier and um, gives you a chance to bring in the vocabulary. Right, this time silent counting and we're going to say the numbers. You only say your numbers, two, four, six, eight. I yeah, only yeah, say just, mine, yeah. three, six, nine, twelve, okay. and Cynthia only says hers, five, ten, fifteen. Yeah. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. six eight. Nine. Ten. 12, 12 14 15 sorry 16 18, 18 20 <laughs> i lost count then yeah, this is a, this is something that you can have lots of fun with especially if you get the learners to just do it on their own and you step back and just don't participate so yeah, that so is but the teachers could do the, uh, the, the, the conducting to explain and to show what happens, but then one of the learners can be a conductor. And you can have lots of laughs. So, and now we're all going to do it. So please choose a number, two, what counting, counting twos. And again, as Tony said, for the early years, you would just say counting in twos, counting in threes, counting in fives, but start with one at a time initially. So, Choose whether you're in twos, threes, or fives, and write it on the chat so we know. And um, we had a lot of fives last time, so make sure that Cynthia and I have someone as well as people doing fives. Are you, <laughs> are you ready to see if I can get, get counting in twos right? Good grief. Okay, oh my God, you're with you, Tony. And ready. Two. Three. I keep going, I'm still going. I missed it. 21. <laughs> 24. 25. 26. 27. 
eight, 30. 30. <laughs> and we all said it at the same time. Now there's a question. The question is, what are we learning? What are we well, learning? Well, we, we're not learning anything new, except perhaps how to, you know, how to do some uh, activities with young learners. But what would the learners be learning? The, the questions that you find on here are questions that you can ask your learners that what, what are called key questions. And these are all questions that you can ask your learners in class. And they're powerful questions that are open. How do you think this will help the learners to understand? What do you think? they will be learning. Somebody's written times tables and lowest common multiple. What we're doing is we're laying the foundation for and connections for understanding of concepts that they will learn later on. And then it depends if the teacher introduces the word factor, then you can, uh, you can talk about 30 and two, three and five being factors of 30. So it's a vehicle for developing number sense, understanding these. Now, I'm going to use a word that's going to come up again because this is part of our program this afternoon, which is sequences. So what we've got here, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, is a, what sort of sequence? Now, if you're teaching, um, yes, sequences. So what sort of sequence? If you're teaching um, upper secondary, you've got a name for this sort of sequence. Three, six, nine, 12, 15 is another one of them. And so is five, 10, 15, 20, and so on. It's important this is laying the foundation for learning about sequences. Um, but what sort of sequences are they? They have a name. Some of you will know the name. Numeric sequences. Somebody said arithmetic or linear. Somebody has said. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. And formulae and things like that. They're all going to come out this afternoon. OK, so we are at this early stage imagining the learners um, being introduced to these ideas and then later on we're going to build on them uh, throughout as we describe the learning spiral. Now I've got a, a lovely um, activity to tell you about and we're going to join in this. Unfortunately there's only three of us to show you so uh, you're going to have to use your imagination and this is very like what we were doing before um, but here um, everyone is given the numbers one and this time one to six. You could have more, but it works extremely well for one to six. And they have to stand in rows facing the orchestra. So if you imagine a class of learners and you'd need an outdoor space or somewhere where you've got some room to do this with all the ones behind each other, all the twos behind each other, all the threes and fours and fives and sixes in the columns um, and um, a conductor at the front. It needs a conductor at the front here. As Caroline was conducting us when we did the skip counting, um, somebody needs to be at the front and conducting this orchestra. Now it's called an orchestra because you can actually, um, you can sing or make sounds. Um, each person can make a different sound. You can do all sorts of um, uh, fun and, and enjoyable different things with this. Um, but we're just going to clap. So number one is going to clap on every beat. Number two on um, two, four, six, and eight. Number three is going to clap on three, six, nine. Uh, number four and four, eight, 12, and so on, the rest of the sequence, because we're going to go, we'll, we'll, we'll count up to, let's count up to 30, shall we, Caroline, if you're going to conduct. Okay. What you can do with the, um, if you've got them, the, the learners standing up, they can clap above their heads like this. So you can see everybody clapping as if you're the, if you're the, um, 
conductor, uh, teacher, you're the conductor at the front. But another thing they can do if they're on chairs is they can stand up. So you can have rows of chairs and they can stand up when it's there. So I would, if we were counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and it's quite good for the, <laughs> to um, get rid of some of those or to use um, constructively some of that energy that children have. Okay, but we're just going to clap on this. So now, instead of just choosing two, three, and five, will you choose one, two, three, four, five, and six? And we're, we're going to clap on, on the beat when it's a multiple of our number. So Caroline, would you like to conduct? And you can count, Caroline, it's just you're not going to clap. So this time, we're doing all the counting and just clapping on our numbers. One, two, three, four, 27, 28, 29, 30. And give yourselves a big clap. It's something that works extremely well with a, with a teacher's effective with the uh, learners around and um, and and you, you introduce it gradually. Um, so there are various alternatives on on this that you might like to try. Um, you can have seven people in a row if you like. Um, people can sit in rows of chairs and stand up when the number called is a multiple of their number. And as I say, that's that's good exercise. Um, now, we have many times, and some of you will remember doing this, when we've had a residential course at our AIMSET courses, we started with this activity on the first evening as an icebreaker and for people to start to get to know each other and have some in, fun together and enjoy doing some, some math, something mathematical together. So what you do is when everybody understands what's involved, they split into groups of sevens, a seven in a group, and each group rehearses a show. And then the groups perform for the whole class. And they do this with actions and noises, uh, music, song, whatever they want to do. They can jump around, they can sit, they can dance to it, but they make it into a show. But as effectively, they count from one to 50 and they do different, each one, each person from one to six does a different action um, or they do the chosen action, whatever it is, um, on, on the multiples of their number. Um, now, this is one that a friend of mine has used several times. So I don't know, I imagine you do this in South Africa sometimes. You have the children from the local primary schools visit the secondary school and that they're going to attend after the holiday. So uh, you might do this, well, in England, we, we would do it in July because our long holiday is in, in August and then they come back to the big school if they move up from primary to secondary in September. And we have a day when the children from the local primary schools visit the secondary school. And my friend who's called Charlie, works for Enrich, has done this with the whole, all of these children from the different schools. So they're not, they don't know Charlie, it's a big school, it's a strange place. And on the school field, and he gets them lined up in, in um, rows and columns like this, but extending way back. And he, uh, with some other teachers to sort of encourage the children and explain it. And then everybody does this together in unison, um, clapping above their heads. And it's, you know, it's a lovely, a lovely synchronous activity if you can get it synchronized. Um, and uh, yes, that's just one suggestion. Another way is if you're outdoors, the children can jump up when it's their turn. And that is a real, um, you know, again, it's all this surplus energy. So now number one, what happens with number one? <laughs> but the thing is that you don't ask them and it's very funny because a lot of them go, oh, I'll just do the one times table thinking, okay, that's the easiest option. And then you actually see their face drop when they realize that they actually have to jump every single time. <laughs> 
Yes, yes. So that's the uh, that's orchestra, and there's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, well, you can ask lots of questions, you see, so it can be a good learning activity. Who claps or stands up every time? Well, Caroline's just told you the answer, but um, that's not obvious at first. The children won't maybe, you know, well, if they've done it, they probably know. And who claps or stands up alternately? That's every other time. And when do two people clap or stand up? Well, now you can, we talked about the lowest common multiple of three numbers, but you can say, okay, when do the twos and the fives stand up? Uh, when do the fours and the sixes stand up together, you know, or clap? Um, uh, when will there be an odd number of people clapping or standing up? Um, well, actually it was pointed out to me that that question isn't quite doesn't quite make sense because it, if you've got a lot of people um but what i mean a lot a, 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 an odd number of columns of people if they're um if they're standing in in this um array that I, I have described here's a more difficult question that you once you get they get used to doing this and um if you think it's worth it you can you can do this which is to instead of counting at one, not uh, do this silently and start as a different number. And then according to the actions, can the people who are watching, this, uh, can they say what's actually happening and um, where you started counting if you didn't count at one. We're moving on to what we call shifting times table. So four, eight, 12, 16, 20 is counting in fours. So and if we add three every time, we get a different sequence, 7, 11, 15, 19, 23. Still the same sort of sequence, still an arithmetic sequence. And this diagram shows a function machine, which we call a mapping diagram. It's, it could be, a, you could call it a function machine. You could call it a mapping diagram, which is the correct mathematical description. And here you see the first box shows you the multiplying by four, which gives you the four times table. So one goes to four, two to eight, and three to 12. And then when you add three, you get seven, 11, and 15. And shifting means moving along. So we take our sequence that we had with the counting, and now we move it along by adding three this time. So, um, you input numbers, you, the numbers you put in, you call inputs, and the numbers that come out, you put, call outputs. And how does the diagram then represent shifting the four times table up three? And what happens if you put 20 into the machine? 20, and then you multiply it by four, and then you add three, and Antoinette has said 83. Now, here's another one. So the question is, what is happening in this diagram? This is what um, uh, Tony has explained on the previous slide, that uh, times in four plus three, uh, the question mark, that the one that was missing, um, two times four is eight, plus three is 11. And the, uh, the third line, three times four is 12. The missing number was 15. You have 12 plus three is 15. So uh, um, now we can combine those two, those two operations, times four plus three, into one rule or one function, which is represented on the, uh, the picture below. So this is a diagram which I've seen in many South African textbooks. So I presume um, our teachers are very familiar with it there, that you have a big box in the middle with arrows coming in and arrows coming out. And uh, that thing in the middle is called the function. So that is your one function, the one rule that turns your inputs into outputs. And I don't know if you can see how big it is on your screens, but we've labeled the inputs N and the output T. So we do whatever goes in, N times four, four N plus three, and what comes out is called T. So T equals four N plus three. All right, so now we've got um, some more input numbers on the right-hand side. 
um, showing you the, the multiples of five this time, and then what happens when we add two to it to get our output. So we've got two different operations, times five add two, which when we combine, we get a function five n plus two. Okay, so now we've sort of experienced uh, what we're, we're looking for. We're looking for what we might call two-step functions. Um, we're looking for a multiplication table and then a shift. So this is up to you now. So that you've got a bit more time this time to think. I think we'll leave this up for a little while. So you're looking, first of all, to find what times tables have we used. And then how big is the shift that we've moved it in order to give the second part of the function? So definitely, please, we're going to see the first one. Yeah. What do you think happens to 7, 12, 17, 22, 27? What is the times table involved? We've given you some clues in that we've actually put the answers and that will also make your typing slightly easier because now all you need to say is sequence A, do we go to, oh, oh Tony's given us that one. <laughs> Steady on Tony, not too fast. I want, I want them to understand what to do. Now they want, now we want them to give us the other four. Yeah, so, you, so A gets matched to two. So if you were writing this on the chat, you would write A2. So now what does B get mapped to? So is B, is it one, three, four, or five? So have a look, spot the table. So the table, the times table that we're using and spot the shift. All right, someone's seen the essay. Don't have to do them in, this, in the same order. Someone's spotted the C, answer to C first. So now we've got one for B. said so C equals one. What about B? B is five. Well, the table says B goes to five. The suggestion is B goes to five. We've also got B goes to four. So let's Ooh, you, you need to check that. We need to give people a, a moment to think. Uh, yes. Uh, Now we've got a B is five, so we've got two fives and one four for B. So let's have someone else. Let's see if we can find what do we think B is mapped to. And D and E, you can try those. Yes, yes, yes. Still, still got, haven't had any answers for those yet. The suggestion that D goes to three by, uh, by NOCO. Uh, and Antoinette agrees with that. And we've got a suggestion that E goes to four. Another D goes to three. So we're beginning to get the uh, um, consensus with there, but we still, D goes to three. We still like a few more people to agree on the, on the B. It's the B one that's causing more problem at the moment. Okay, so here they are. Nine tables, yes. Yes, and it was five, as you just spotted, because we're shifting in nine to 11. So we've got the, it's the two times table. We're adding two every time. And those of you who um, think about it, remember, adding loads of two, lots and lots of twos, is the shorthand for adding two many times is to multiply by two. So that is the, the clue that that's the two times table, which... Uh, is the one that you've, you see five gives us the two times table two n. And it shifted if we, instead of starting at two, we start at nine. So the shift of our two times table, it's moved along seven places. So it's two n plus seven. Well, now you can obviously make up your own sequences and rules. So there's a lot of scope there, but we haven't got time. If we had, you know, if we'd had more time, we would share this now and um, people could make up their own sequences and share it with other with the rest of us. But you can do that. I'm sure you can do that. Now, um, <clears throat> we're going to play a game. This is the function game and we'll demonstrate it. And uh, Caroline has now got um, some columns there of um, which she's going to write on. And 
I'm going to play a game with Caroline and I'm going to give her the number five and she's going to put it in the input column. Five and 23. OK, what about um, two? OK, what about ten? Ten is, let me get this right, 48. I got it right. Oh, I'm, I'm finding this very difficult. Um, unless, oh. unless I got it wrong, so I think I've got it. I'm double checking. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've got it right. Hmm. <laughs> can I can I have a go? Please do. Please do. That, that's the idea. Every, every everyone would have a go. Okay. So if you put in uh, six, then uh, I think it's 28. Yay, yes. <laughs> oh, you're cle you're cleverer than me. Smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're cleverer than me. Um, all right, so if you can guess the rule, people, put this, um, put this on, on the um, chat. Um, I'm going to give another number, um, three. Can you, um, Cynthia's, uh, Cynthia's guess the rule and, um, we'd like you and to guess the rule. Antoinette has put a rule up. We got one. Uh, Oh, yes, okay. And to that has put five N take away two. So five fours are 20, take away two is 23. 10 take away two is eight. Uh, 50 take away two is 48. 30 take away two is 28. And 15 take away two is 13. I think you've got the idea. This is called the uh, the uh, what am I doing game we didn't ask that question but it's one the teacher can ask the class and what the way we play this is when um, somebody guesses the rule they don't they don't give the rule they just give the output so the teacher gives the input they give the output and then the teacher asks them not to tell the other learners because we want everybody to have a chance to guess it and you go on for a long time until a lot of the learners have actually guessed and then when you stop the learners explain to the ones who have been able to guess the rule explain it to the other learners so that's the function game and it can be played as a pre-algebra learning activity for say years six and seven or grade six and seven, or for older learners, and you can use more complicated functions. It can be played by the whole class, led by the teacher, or in smaller groups, taking it in turns to ask the question, what am I doing? And everybody else guesses the rule. So I don't know whether you've met this before. Um, it's often called the function game or the what am I doing game. Uh, and uh, it, they can, it can be done in pairs or small groups. They do need to agree before they start playing which um, functions they're using. Um, you can just stick to adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, but you can put in other operations like squaring numbers if you want to. And um, the winner is the player who guesses the rule correctly with the smallest number of clues. So that's the function game. Yes, yeah, so as Tony said, this can be played with uh, with all age groups and on the courses that we've run before, um, we've used this many times. Anyone who watched my webinars would have seen us play the function game, but the, uh, the game using the box, uh, I've seen many times and we get intermediate teachers to wear these boxes on their head. You can actually get someone to, uh, to stick their head in it and their head can be the, the machine that's working it. So you need a box and it needs a hole on the left hand side and a hole on the right hand side and you can imagine that um, the, the mystery thing inside whatever's inside the box is doing something to your input and turning out an output 
And as I say, it, it can be quite fun and very, very visual. Um, so what, what you need to do is, well, you can work just like the function game. You can have, but you can put in pieces of paper. So you can have on a card, you can write something uh, as your input, either um, usually a, a number. And if somebody is wearing this as a, um, you know, as a hat, then their head can be the machine. But uh, that doesn't have to, but you can get the, the teacher or somebody else, the person who's got the information in their head to take out the card from the other side. And so your input goes in one side, you put the card there, someone puts in and reaches through and takes the card out. And without letting anyone see what it is, uh, work out the answer and give that answer Either they can write it, if we're playing this silently, they can write it on the scrap of paper or write it up on the board um, as the output. So you have, you can, the trick really is to play this in silence so people aren't making, aren't guessing and aren't disturbing. So you put a silent number in, a silent number comes out, and you have to work out what was the machine doing in the middle. Uh, but then, as what Tony hasn't moved on to, with the other one to say is that um, it's very, very, very useful to do it as inverses. So if um, you know that you've, once you've cracked what the code is, if you say, right, so if output's 14 and you've been playing this game, what do you think was the input? If you know what the machine, you know, if you can work out what the machine was doing, then what yeah. is You've had no, you've had no examples. This is the first one, but this would be the input. Yeah. If, with my, with the function I've got here. So as you say, there's many different ways that you can play this game, um, depending on the ability levels of your class that you're dealing with, and and what your aim for the lesson is. But it's a very, very useful thing to play, and uh, I say it really gives the the learners the greater experience of, uh, of inputs and outputs and, and working out functions. This is something pretty obvious. What we're doing here is to um, look at these 100 squares and to shade in pattern. You'll find it in this multiple patterns learning activity on aiming high. What patterns do you get? So here you see the patterns. So the questions are, what, one of the questions, there are lots of questions you can ask here. But one of the questions is, why are there vertical lines for the twos and the fives? What would the patterns be for tens? What patterns can you see for the three times table? Is there more than one type of pattern in the three times table? Is there a connection between the patterns in the three, four, six, seven, and eight times tables? Big question, of course, would be what would happen if we overlaid them all? That is that a question. big question. Yes, I that's love a lovely that question. question. Yeah. So why do this? Well, again, this is an activity that, uh, that I have used many, many times uh, on the courses and in the the study guides that we produce for our online courses, um, because you're you're beginning to to expand the idea of um, of multiples. Um, you're looking at um, factors. So these words that we've been using before, if you really examine the uh, the ones that like the the three, the nine, the twelve, you will see why um, you know the same, some numbers are shaded. The same numbers are shaded in different grids. Um, you can, as you say, look at the, the similarities between them. But what, what I really like to do is to get them, when they've understood the problem, is to then shade one big grid with all the multiples on. And then what you will see, what you are left with, the numbers that are not shaded, if they're not a multiple of any, um, any of the numbers, we can start to think of prime numbers because prime numbers only have two factors, as we know, one and the number itself. Um, so they, if they don't have any other factors, if they're not shaded, then they are prime numbers. And that's called the sieve of Aristophanes, which is the, 
something that you can look up. There's a link there on the uh, on the screen in front of you. So there are lots and lots of um, things that the learners can get from this. As you say, those um, the listing down there. Um, apart from the all the different vocabulary that we've introduced, um, multiplication, division, factors, multiples, common multiples. Um, we're also using visualization and if they're not quite sure um, of their tables at any one point, that they can use the, the patterns that they see to, you know, to continue the pattern without having to know whether, I don't know whether 91 is a multiple of anything in particular. Um, you know, when you're shading these squares, you can use your um, visual sense of what's going on to find all the numbers that you need. And it's a great poster to have the multiples one to ten and then the, the sieve as well on one poster is a really good one to have on your oh right i would like you all to please follow my instructions so first thing is close your eyes we are going to do a little bit of calculation just close your eyes and choose any number to start with, any number at all. Now multiply it by three. Then add six. Now take away your original number. Divide by two. Take away your original number again. Please put in the chat box what number you got. I'm going to repeat the process if anyone got lost in the process or didn't hear all of the instructions. But please go ahead and write in the chat what your answer was. I'm going to do it again. Multiply by take it, choose a number, multiply it by three, add six, take away your original number, divide by two, and take away your original number again. I got three, by the way. Thank you, Caroline. I got three. <laughs> what about other people? You'll see some examples here. If you start with 15, uh, with five, and you multiply by three, you get 15. If you add six, you get 21. If you take away five, you get 16. If you divide by two, you get eight. And if you take away five, you get three again. Mary, Mary says three. Um, Matanya says three. Why is it three? Why are so many people saying three? And the example starting with seven on the uh, PowerPoint slide also goes seven, 21, 27, 20, 10, three. So can you explain it? How would you explain it? And now this is a great thing to do with a class and get them to explain it. You can give the explanation in words or as a formula. And so can your learners. So you might ask them to explain it to each other in pairs, try to puzzle out why everybody's getting three. Maybe get them to create a function box, see what would happen inside the function box. Now this is a function box, which would have to have um, one, two, three, four, five operations in it, wouldn't it? The thing is, this, is, this can be a pre-algebra activity before they do any algebra. And you can do it in primary school. Um, they can still explain why if they think about it. In most classes, a lot of children will come to the answer why it must be always be three. Why is it whatever you do, you come out with three as the answer? And you really need to think about what's actually happening there in a general sort of way. Um, so this is um, quite makes you think quite hard mathematical thinking going on in there what's happening how many times do you take away your number and what are, what else do you take away um
And what do you add? And mm, what do you add? What do you take away? Um, and what happens in the process to whatever's in this function box, what's happening? And why is three coming out every time? You see, by the time you've multiplied by three, you're going to have your number in there three times, but you take it away twice, so you get back to your number. But what about this adding six? Um, what happens there? You add six. I'm sorry, Tony, you take away your number three times because you take away your number before you divide by two. So that's that's why it works. It says take away your number, then divide. So you take away your number once, but then you divide by two. So or, when you, or you could simply look at it, you could yes. simply look at it. But yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, Cynthia's so right. Added, Cynthia's absolutely yeah, okay. right. You take right. away your number three times. You've multiplied it by three, but you take away three times, and it's the six divided by two, which is three, that comes out in the end. So there it is in words without any algebra. So Caroline, would you like to explain the algebra? I will do my best. Let's go for it. So your input is x. That's the number you're putting in. And then what you're doing, you're multiplying x by 3. So you've now got 3x. And then the next thing you're doing is adding 6. So 3x plus 6. So far, so good. Now, take away your original number. What do we have to do to take away the original number, which we called x? So no matter what number you chose, we called that x. So we've now got 3x plus 6 minus x, which leaves us with 2x plus 6. Now, we're going to divide the whole thing by 2. So we've got 2x plus 6 divided by 2 is 3 plus x. Now we're going to take away your number x. So what did we do? This is what a magician would call a force. You're forcing a number to be chosen, which is the number three in this case. And it's, you can see the algebra is super simple. And it's also something that you don't have to call algebra at all until you time you can introduce algebra in this way. It's a really, really simple step-by-step -step way of understanding what you're doing and making clear what's happened in this mind reader activity. You can create your own number tricks, have a go at it and do it with your classes. And it's a great way to, you don't have to be, you know, to, to develop mathematical thinking. Uh, you don't actually have to do it with algebra, but then you can begin to say, um, so Cynthia, you do something very clever by replacing the variable with an object, don't you? <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I, uh, and what I often use is have matchboxes and uh, counters. So, uh, um, and, and I just go through the whole thing. We start off with, um, instead of using X, I would use a, a matchbox because, you know, what does it stand for? It's just a, an inanimate object. And I usually blue tack it or press press stick it to the board and we just follow the whole sequence of, uh, of events down using our matchbox and you can use counters for numbers so i would have a matchbox for x and then i'd have the next step would be three matchboxes and then the next step would be three matchboxes and uh, six little counters and so again it's there's no it's not algebra it's a physical object which uh, the learners can you know can understand yeah, so, so there you are, Mind Reader, that's a great activity. So we've got some of our sequences like we've seen before. We've got the, the sequence 7, 10, 13, 16, 16, 19. But this time we've extended them uh, forwards and backwards. So remember, these were our shifting times tables. So our shifting times tables now have uh, formed the, the black numbers. And we're seeing what happens when we go forward three or backwards three and trying to, to fill in the other numbers. Um, and then 
the other thing that that's so that's the, num the numbers that we're dealing with. If you look at the diagram on the right, what we've done is we've plotted uh, our sequence on um, a on a grid, and we the number seven, which is in black from the seven, ten, thirteen. Number seven is the first term of our sequence. Remember that's where we started when we did our shifting times tables and looked for the formula. So seven is term number one. So um, we've plot, if you look at the red, the red dots along there, we've plotted against the number one on the x-axis, we've plotted seven. And then as we go up in steps, seven goes up to 10, to 13, to 16. So every one, one move to the right, we go up three steps. Yeah. And so that's the, the first one that we've um, that we've plotted the red line and we've labeled that red line C, if you see right at the top. Question is how, how does it relate? Well, I've just explained to that it relates because every step we take, every jump is a jump of three from seven to 10, 10 to 13, 13 to 16 and so on. So now if you look at the representation in blue, which is labeled, uh, no, sorry, not that yet. We look at the, the B and A, B, is the next one down. I'm sorry, I won't tell you that, which whether it is or not, but <laughs> the next numbers down are 15, 18, 21, 24. And the third sequence is the one, negative two, negative five, negative eight, negative 11. Now we've got two lines, more lines drawn on our graph. We've got one that's dotted to B and one that's dotted to A. Um, Perhaps I ought to just quickly say why we've used dotted lines. Just um, as you can see the red, we've plotted the red dots, but we've joined them with a dotted line because we have no information for what happens in between, have we? This is a, a, a discrete sequence, our sequence of dots is a step. So the dotted line just shows the direction of travel, so to speak. So look at the dotted lines to B and the dotted line to A and which sequence do you think they come from? What multiplication table have we shifted to get them? And what's particular, or notice more notice all about what's different about the third sequence? So the first two sequences are from multiplication tables shifted. So what's the multiplication table that was shifted for sequence one? 7, 10, 13, 16. What's the multiplication table? What is the multiplication table that we've used for 15 to 18 to 21 to 24? Shorthand for lots of adding, remember? Uh, if you add two together seven times, you know, two plus two plus two plus two plus two plus two plus two, plus two the quick way is saying seven twos are 14. So what have we added and therefore what is the multiplication table that we're looking at? We're going from 7 to 10, 10 to 13. And to net says 3. Mm -hmm. 18 to 21. What about the second one? Yeah, 18 to 21. Okay. So I think we can see that the, the jumps we're going up in are threes, so adding lots of threes, so it must be the three times table. So we're shifting the three times table in both cases, but we've got two different lines. We've got two different sequences. Right? So the difference is not the times table, the difference is the shifting. Yeah? That we've shifted our three times table. The first time our three times table has moved from three to 15, so we've shifted it by 12. Uh, whereas the seven to 10, the three times table, we've shifted it by four. So we've got the same times tables, different shifts. So we've got different dotted lines, which should tell us, give you a few more clues now. So what sequence relates to line B and which sequence relates to line C? It's an arithmetic sequence, it's a straight line, but uh, which of the shifting times tables is B? Is B 15, 18, 21, 24, 27? Or is B 1, negative 2, negative 5, negative 8, negative 11? So which one is B? Just to make it easier for you to type. So 
we look at line B. Just give me the first two numbers of the sequence that gives you line B. Anyone the line may go well up of in, you know, it doesn't stop with where my picture stops there. No. Antoinette says B is 15, 18, 21. Yes, mm -hmm. and she's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if you notice, if you look at the green dotted line and the red dotted line, you should notice that they are in fact parallel. Yeah, they are parallel lines, just shifted. I'm using that word shift again. What do we notice about line A? It is definitely not parallel. But if you can see it's sloping in a different direction, it's sloping backwards. And so we're beginning now to look at what is it that makes a line slope backwards? What is it that makes B and C parallel? Look at our, Tony has put up the, uh, the equations of those lines now. Line C, the one we started off with with our first sequence is 3n plus 4. Line B is 3n plus 12. So what we can say, what stays the same? If the lines are parallel, the slope stays the same. So which of those bits of the formula do you think tells us that the lines are parallel? And what is it about t equals negative 3n plus 4 that tells us that our line slopes backwards? So things to notice, things to, to look at. Line D. What about line D? What do we know about that? Does it slope? Is it as steep as line C? Does it meet line C anywhere? Does it cross over? If they're not parallel, parallel lines don't meet, don't cross, but C and D are not parallel, so they do cross. Uh, where do they cross over? Why do they cross over? All questions that you can get your learners to explore. If you want more information, you want the, uh, the teacher's notes and the guides and so on, uh, go to the Aiming High website. It's called Steps. Yes, there's a lot you can do with that. And what we're doing there is linking the sequences to points on, on these lines. And it, it, as Cynthia's explained, it, you can also see that line A and C are reflections of each other in, in the y axis. And now we're going to go on to look at. Uh, the whole line, so I've, I've taken off those red spots. Um, so we use n for the numbers one, two, three, and t for the terms, as we did on the last slide, for points with only whole number coordinates, where we're just talking about the sequence. So we're moving now from the steps and the sequences to linear functions, to graphs, and in a minute we'll be thinking about gradients. So again, we can give us, our learners sequences like this and we can ask them to continue the sequence on and to continue the sequence back as we did just now. And that's the first one and there's uh, two and three as before. And there is the other one, which uh, is line D, which uh, I've put um, with the others. So you have, um, the four lines in the with the the formula which gives the function, but there we are only having for the particular function um, which gives a sequence. We're only having whole number inputs, but if our inputs can be any number whatsoever, literally any number, then we're going to have the whole line. Now, there we very often use the variables x and y. So we're going to distinguish between if we've just got grid points, which is linking the sequence to all the whole line, and the linear function, which means you've got to join up those grid points to make the whole line. Now I want you to imagine yourself. Um, so imagine you are climbing the red steps. That's why it's called steps. Imagine you're climbing the red steps from the point minus three, five, to the point 313. So you go up um, from minus three, five. Can you see it's here? Minus three, minus five, yeah. Minus three, minus five. And yes, I said five, minus five. Minus three, minus five, 
Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven steps here. Now imagine you climb from the same point. Cynthia asks, where do, the, do these two lines intersect? They, the lines um, B, C and D intersect at this point, minus three, minus five. And if instead of going up the red steps, you go up the, the blue steps, which in the first instance are sort of hidden, but then you can see the blue steps. Okay. Um, and you go up to the point three, seven, which is, which is, which is here. Um, there we go, three, seven is here. Um, which is the steeper climb? And why? And how could you measure the steepness of the climb? Now, I'm sure you can answer these questions. Um, but what we're asking is, um, you know, uh, how we're relating the mathematics here of um, gradients. We're going to introduce this word gradient. Um, we're relating it to an idea everybody knows about climbing steps and the red is steep steps and the blue are little steps, not so, not so, well, not so steep, they're quite steep, not so steep. And these are questions you can ask your learners. Which is the steeper climb and why is it steeper? And how would you measure the steepness of the climb? Now, how about answering that question? How would you measure the steepness of the climb? I'm sure we all know it's gradients or, uh, and, and you maybe introduce the learners to a formula. So how do you measure the steepness of the climb? The climb on line C from one grid point to the next, or as, as um, steeper than the, the climb on line D. And that says the difference in the height divided by the difference in the length of each step. Take two points and the coordinates, you, you divide the difference in the Y coordinate divided by the difference in the X coordinate. Now, another way of measuring it is to say, how much do you climb up for each step across of one unit? So that's what you see here. What you see on this graph is every time you go across one, what do you go up? But Aaron has said on line C, you go up three and on line D, you go up two. Another answer as to how you would measure the gradient is it's the distance you go up for every one unit you go across. And um, that's, that's your gradient. So what we've done here is we've started off with sequences. We've then put our sequences, um, as plotted them as points on, on, on graphs. And then we've talked about linear functions where we join up all the points um, between those grid points. And now we're talking about gradients. And it's then the multiplication table, which is giving us the gradient because with line C that came originally from taking the multiplication table or multiples of three and, um, uh, and adding, <coughs> adding uh, four each time. Uh, and it, if you see that goes through the point naught four so it's the line 3x plus 4, that's the line C. And if you look at the line D, that came from the multiplication 2, but adding 1 each time. So instead of being 2, 4, 6, 8, it was 3, 5, 7, 9. And um, then you can see that goes through the point 0, 1. Okay. So the next one is all about building functions yeah so in this one we've got four friends amy busi um chris and dudu they've used different operations to build their functions remember a function is made up of one or more operations we've got a choice of four operations here the operations are take away two multiply by three divide by two or add five now, Amy's gone 
very simple. She's just chosen one. So she's chosen one of our functions. She's chosen plus five. Boosie, one of our operations, sorry. Boosie has chosen two operations to combine to make her function. She's chosen times three and take away two. And Chris has chosen three of the operations and do do four. Now they've all put one as their input and now they're working out their outputs. Okay. Amy's obviously got the easiest uh, job, so she only has to do one thing. She puts in one, she adds five, and her output is six. Okay. Boosie, slightly more complicated, she puts in one. One times three is three, then she subtracts two, so she gets left with one. So her input is one and her output is one. So now the question to you is, what is Chris's output and what is Dudu's output? So they, remember, they both put in one. The input is one. So what are the two different, or are they different? What are the two outputs? Somi says C is 13 divided by two. 13 divided by two, six and a half, C, I guess. Okay. Fabo says it's 6.5. And D is seven divided by two. Eight. Malu Leke agrees with um, Chris's one. 13 divided by two or 6.5. Yeah. Oh, good. So we're getting the same results from, from the people who are responding. Are we? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. We just had another one from Tabo as well. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So, um, so yes, we're getting the right put. So what you can now get in your classes, and you can use differentiation for this because there we have, Amy can just choose, or your weaker learners could just choose a very simple function, whereas you can certainly give your uh, faster learners or your more able learners um, a more difficult choice and tell them they have to choose more than one, so two or three, and they can build their own functions. They choose inputs, and uh, work out the outputs as an extension, you can ask them what happens if they put in a, a, a letter, a variable, and to see, you know, to put in a letter rather than, or my matchbox rather than uh, an actual number. So as you see, we've got four different operations, four things we can do with our variable, with our uh, input. But if you then restrict it and say, for the next part of this is you're only to choose two, so you've got your class that they, they can choose two of these operations. They must be different, two different ones. They can't use the same one twice. Um, they've got four to choose from. How many different functions could they possibly make? So this is something that you could do as a group, um, or as a whole class, depending on how, you, how many learners you have and how you organize your classroom. But the idea is to work out how many and what are these different functions if you can only have two operations in your function and your choices are any two from this list of four. This is a great thing for you to do with your classes to find how many different functions you can find using two of the four operations. So you've got minus, and we're being systematic here. This chart is enabling us to be very systematic. So you start with, you've got the functions minus two times three plus is it plus? I can't divide, divide, by, by, divide by two. Divide by two, you can't see it. And, um, and add five. Those are the four functions using just two of those systematically, two of those at a time. You can see that there are 12, but the question you'd ask is how many are there? And get between with the whole class, get those all of those rolled in. I love this sort of um, exercise where you leave the empty box if somebody hasn't found it and maybe um, leave it for the next lesson if the lesson comes to an end and you haven't filled all the boxes and then ask the learners to find the missing ones. Here you've got the 12 answers. Shows you the valuable skills of working systematically and make it therefore making sure that you've got all the answers. When they come up with all of them, you go, are you sure you have found them all? And because you've worked systematically, starting with minus two, well, what options are there? You can, after, if you start with minus two, you can only either times three, divide by two, or add five. 
to follow it. So starting with the same number, you can see all the different possible answers. And you, as you can see, you get the same answer using different functions and in different orders. So it's a very powerful activity. So if you look, for example, on the third column at the bottom, you're going six to three to eight. And what in on that column, you go from six to three every time. So you're dividing by two. But at the bottom there, you're doing divide, dividing by two and adding five. So that's a half X plus five. And you'll see all the functions there. But what would happen if you were, you were going to use all of the um, four, fun, four operations? And that would be quite a lot more challenging. So it's something, again, the differentiation you could give to your high flyers and a group of them could work together to produce a poster for all four operations. So this is a good exercise in getting your heads around functions and, and, and formulae. So Cynthia, do you want to talk about inverse functions? Oh, right, yes, I, I just didn't know, I wasn't realizing the bottom was coming up first. That's brilliant. <laughs> so we have mentioned uh, inverse functions before when we were talking about the, uh, the box for the, uh, the input output box. Uh, that uh, and it's very very important part of, of we can uh, use inverse functions and a very simple place to start with your uh, youngest learners is just to be very practical and say to them well you know if you've um, you know you're standing there at school with your shoes and socks on that uh, you know you can't take your socks off until you've taken your shoes off so this is a very very visual and very simplistic but powerful little little message if you start with your bare feet put on your socks and then your shoes the inverse absolutely has to be that the shoes have got to come off first you can't get to your socks until you've done that and then eventually get back to your your bare feet so the the principle of inverse operations is whatever was done last on the way in on your to your input you have to do first when you are inversing so you do things in the reverse order so going back to our functions that we before we had the same input of one now on this page we're asking you to consider the same output so we've all they're all standing there with their output with their shoes and socks on and uh, they've all got 10 as their output so can we work back and think what the input must have been and again we've got the differentiation here good old amy if our output is 10 well, what did she do when she went on the way in? On the way in, she started to, with her number and added five. So to inverse it, if we've got 10 as the answer going backwards through our function box, we've got to subtract our five first. So we go 10, take away five, her input must have been five. Okay, now Busy, slightly more complicated. What she did was times three and then take away two. So if we're going to inverse that, the first thing we've got to inverse is the takeaway two. So what is our inverse of subtraction? In any case, it's add. So if she started with 10, sorry, I'm starting with 10 because she finished with 10. So our output is 10. To inverse 10, we have to add the two, the inverse of the negative two. So we get to 12. And then instead of times in three, the opposite or inverse of times is divide. So we divide by three. So our 12 divided by three gives us four. So Boos's input must have been four. Now, the wonderful thing about all these is that uh, you can, or your learners can self-check because what they then have to do is say, right, is that right? Was my input four? Well, let's check it. Let's start with the input four. Four times three is 12, take away two is 10. So they can check their own work and be confident that they've worked their inverse operations in the right in the right order. So now your little job very quickly, if you can. Um, the output for Chris and Dudu is both, in both cases is 10. So what were their inputs? Now the, the slide is suggesting two and a half and five and one third, but are they correct? Do you agree? So can you just check if the output for Chris and Dudu 
is 10. What was the input? Are some of you are way ahead of me. Brilliant. So what we've got here, C. Um, we've said 12. That was from before. Is that true? So let's start with, give us a few more. We want a few more answers to whether we decide that that's right. So this person thinks C is not two and a half. No, it's um. Hang on, that's from before. <laughs> but it's not four either, is it? So let's have some more answers. Let's work C back. While while I'm doing that, perhaps you can have another think about uh, D. Um. So C, if if ten comes out, output ten. What was the last operation? The last operation was add five. So we have to subtract five from ten. So 10 subtract 5 is 5, yeah? Then the next operation, we have to inverse the times 3, so divide by 3. So we want 5 divided by 3. And then the last thing we're to do to that is then double it. So 5 divided by 3, but doubled will give... 10 divided by 3, have we had? Yes, we've got a 10 divided by 3 on the answer. Well, <laughs> and 10 divided by 3 is 3 and 1 third. So Chris's answer that he gave as 2 and a half is wrong. So C's, Chris's answer is wrong. Chris's answer should be 10 divided by 3, positive 10 divided by 3. Have we got any options for doodos? I know it's a, it's a longer one. Well, let's see if I can do my, see if my mental... Arithmetic will cope with, with uh, four operations. So let's start at the end, remember? 10, instead of plus five, we subtract 10, take away five is five. Now, inverse the divide by two, we multiply by two. Five multiplied by two is 10, so I get to 10. And I've got inverse times three, so I divide by three. 10 divided by three, I'm leaving it that there for the minute. 10 divided by three. And then instead of uh, inverse my takeaway two, I add two. So I've got 10 divided by three, add two. Now we did 10 divided by three, didn't we, in the previous one? 10 divided by three is three and a third, then add two. So that's three, add two must be five and one third. Five and one third. Ah, oh, that's what the chart said at the top. Dudu's answer was five and one third. So I think I agree with that. And then the extension is, well, what would happen if the output was 20? Um, and then this is something, or you could make these up in your classroom. You could just tell them numbers that, to work with depending on the ability of your, your learners and whether they can cope with fractions. Now, if, if you want to simplify this, obviously you have to work these out in advance. If you think your learners can't cope with too many fractions, then you need to find some whole number answers that will work. So uh, it's up to you as teachers to tailor this type of activity to suit the abilities of your class. And of course, you want them to get some practice in fractions, so you might use well, this yes. as a different way to get involved with fractions. <laughs> decisions, decisions, but all yours. So let's have a summary. Where have we been with this workshop? We, If you look at what we've been doing, we started with clap counting and skip counting which were actually just the multiplication tables, but as a sequence um, and um, adding the uh, other number. So we shifted our sequences. And then we looked at patterns of multiples. Um, but we are, we were into do, uh, introducing function machines there. So with the five times table, it's multiply by five and add two. So from five, 10, 15, 20, 25, we got seven, 12, 17, 22, 27. So we got different arithmetic sequences there. And then we thought about um, the function machine and this one halved. So there's a little joke on that slide, don't put your hand in it. It said halves all those pieces of fruit. Um, but it's perfectly harmless when you come to halve numbers, of course. Of course, you can see there the one of the examples of patterns of multiples. Um, and that is all connected here. It's all about multiples, isn't it? This whole um, session has been in one way or another connected with multiples. 
and shifting the times tables. And then I will, we, link, we linked that to the steps and the graphs and the linear functions. And of course the sequences just gave us the, the y coordinates of the points on the graph. Um, and then when we joined them up, we had linear equations. So we've got linear functions, linear equations, and the rule there that we've got is for line C was 3n plus 4. Um, and then we looked at um, the, the, the hat, the, the magician's hat there and wand was about having fun with numbers and coming up with surprising results that um, can be explained by algebra, but pre-algebra can be explained with words. And then we had our examples with one or two or three or four simple functions put together to make um, combined functions. And um, the formulas are given there for those. And we talked about, so the last thing we were talking about was inverse functions. And there's a picture of somebody with their shoes and socks on. But when you come to combining functions, of course, with the functions, the raw ingredients, um, just two functions, you can make lots of different um, combined functions with the two. And so the, um, the diagram there is what you've seen earlier, where you had to be systematic to find all the solutions. So we went across from the multiplication tables, shifting the tables, getting sequences, steps on the graph and gradients, and then building functions and undoing the functions to get inverse functions. Just the lists of all the activities that we've used and where to find them on the Aiming High website. Worth looking at it because as I was say, they, there are, these are not just the only ones, there are loads and loads of resources and uh, we do strongly advise you all to get, uh, to get uh, onto their website, the Aiming High website. And um, you, you can just put the title there, Shifting Times Tables or Multiple Patterns or Mind Reader in the search and it'll take you immediately to um, the activity that we've, and much more about these activities than we've been able to explore this afternoon. Yeah, including the very, very useful teachers, teachers' notes which, uh, and, and copies of the worksheets that we've used. Thank you all for joining us and hope you you've got something out of this workshop and um, we'll be able to use the ideas in your classroom and if you can share your your feelings about it and uh, if you use it in your classroom please tell us this is a global teacher empowerment network video collaborating with aimsec and the aiming high website our mission is to benefit children in disadvantaged communities all over the world by empowering the teachers who teach them mathematics